Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends of the Uncharted podcast, what a treat today. Um, movie star extraordinaire, uh, taking the world of country music by storm, Mr. Grayson Russell. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us, my friend. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I uh, I was so pumped. Um, your your PR people have been more than good to me throughout the years, and your name slid across the thing. And of course, they put um, Talladega Nights and you know Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I know you hear it all the time, but you know uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I bet I've watched it three billion times, and uh, you know all grown up. I was like, man, time flies. I'm sitting here. I'm 42 years old, and I just man, I watched that in my 20s, the height of my, you know, and I was like, God, it's so funny. And here you are, just grown yes sir <laughs> that's yes, awesome sir. and um i just moved uh from middle tennessee columbia tennessee yes, to muscle shoals about a year ago sir. and i learned that you were from alabama which is awesome and now you're in now I'm in Nashville. yeah we just swap swap spots yeah it's all i mean it's 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 all good either way i mean this is a music uh dominated historical area and of course nashville and um just, I was reading your story, man. And it's awesome. You know, and we'll get to talking everything. Uh, the songwriting's phenomenal. Uh, Beneath the Bow, I mean, it's talking about the working class folks speaking my language and, and in a great time right now where uh, country is just, you know, trying to fight to keep ourselves afloat. So let's uh, let's kick off with this new song, man. Very, very deep, very deep lyrics. I uh, really like it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. What um where the where did inspiration come from? What made you decide to get this going? So beneath the bow was the first song that that kind of came to me with with what will ultimately be this whole record, which will be about fourteen songs. Um, it was given to me by a guy. His name is Brian Oxley, who uh runs Johnny Cash's estate. Him and his wife uh, have a uh, they run Johnny's farm out in Bon Aqua, and he said, "Hey man, I'm a songwriter. I want to play some of my stuff." Which usually that can go either way. Most yeah. of the time, it's all. And, uh, and he stuck down and played me five or ten of his songs, and Beneath the Bow really stuck out to me. And and he said, man, if you want to cut it, you can. And there was a there was a few things I, I wanted to change about it lyrically, and, and there were things. He handed the reins over to me. He said, look, you do um, you you do the song justice, whatever that takes, however you can do it well and communicate it effectively, you do it. Um, and he was just very gracious and let me have it. And uh, so I was able to take it and rewrite what I wanted to rewrite and change up the arrangement, how I wanted to do it. And I've been very thankful to uh, – to, to have had that experience and get to get to have it it's great to to have input on creative control and get to kind of have free reign with it, especially as the artist who's also performing it i mean it helps a lot when you're you know you're able to be in the space where you can like uh, you know put your own spin on it but just uh you know a one, wonderful song very very lyrically deep and uh i just like how it talks blue collar man i mean just like i said perfect timing with yes, the way the country is going through and um now let me get this right uh because i i've listened to the two songs you've got are you releasing singles one at a time and then a full album or, or how's yes, it going? Yes, yeah. so far that's the plan unless, unless the plan changes uh that's how we'll do it we'll drop about one a month or one every you know eight weeks and uh, yeah. or, or six weeks and and see how it does you know i mean it, it's part of people know me as an actor and i've been very fortunate to have the career that i've had there but they don't know that i started touring when i was five um, and so this is just another part of my life that I'm that I've had the privilege of of being able to just lean into now uh, at at this point um, now because I know that you know when I'm you know 60 70 sitting at the house I'm gonna wish that you know this is the time that I that I that I stood on this and leaned into it and uh, here we are yeah well you know obviously you know. Uh from a kid as an actor you got that great country draw and then now that your voice is deep and i mean it's just you're what country music needs right now because man they, they're all over the place they can't figure out what they're, what they're trying to do but but the way you've got you've got like that eclectic mix like you sound like the old guard like you said like your uh merle haggards and your your Waylands and all them and then you, then you sound like uh, you know some of the songwriting and the lyricists just, just flow just perfectly right into the future um so just good job um, do you have full band touring? Like I, I saw you did something for the vets, which is awesome, but do you have yes, any dates other than that? Uh, right now, uh, the only thing we'll, we'll put on the calendar, I've got to confirm probably next week is a show. We, we've played it for the past three years. It's funny enough. It's the world's largest, uh, Christian music festival up in, uh, um, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It runs about 40,000 people. So uh, we played that past three years, four years, something like that. Um, that's the only one on the docket right now. Uh, I've got a couple of right around different things I'll play here around town, but I, I just wrapped this TV show. So my, my schedule has been uh, kind of 
blank and put out as far as shows from about September to November. And then we'll get back into the second half of season two, February to April. Um, So we won't hit the road big until May. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you are still healthily healthily active in uh, movies, I should say, acting. Uh, yes, sir, yeah. and whatnot. So you're multifaceted. You're just burning the candle at both ends. And uh, yes, and Nashville's like the Mecca now. That's where everybody kind of converted to Los Angeles. So, I mean, it seems like I guess everybody you might be working with might be neighbors to some sort yeah. or whatever. So yeah. that's awesome. So you said you're doing a TV show. Is that um the one with the guy from that thing you do? I can't yes, remember. Sir, with Jonathan Check, I was texting him earlier. Yes, sir. Yeah, what a cool, what a cool cat. I've never met him, but um, he was at a Comic Con. Uh, I, I think he was supposed to be at uh, Spring Hill or in Franklin, and then COVID hit. You know, so we were all kind of, and which is, I, I read, I guess your website. That's kind of what made you decide to kind of take uh, music right. more seriously. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it was uh, it, over over COVID is when I started writing. That was the first time I had been moved to really moved enough to write. Um, because yeah. up until that point, you know, I was kind of under the belief and still am to some extent you know why would anybody want to hear what i have to say any more than they would want to hear us play free bird yeah or or yeah. or stay or something else you know and so it wasn't until i was mad enough to write and realize like oh this ain't half bad that you know i really leaned into it yeah because like you said having the credibility you have as an actor because you know there's lots of actors like uh um the box masters just came through um uh, muscle shoals billy bob thornton and yeah, like, a couple weeks ago cool uh did you go to the nashville winery is there you yes. you want to yes. yes, um well what i like about what you did i'm gonna give you a compliment here just like he does is that um at first they're going to come see you because of who you are movie wise acting and everything but once they get there and find out you can actually sing and perform and like i said you're, you're great with your own uh, lyrics that's what's going to keep them coming that's what separates oh it's just a movie star singing you know just cover songs versus hey this guy really knows what he does because like i said box masters they've probably pumped out what eight nine ten albums so Oh gosh, I think I want to say they might have done more. I think they've done seventeen. Yeah, you might be. I know they pump out a lot. It just seems like I mean, you no, know, let's just, see. box masters uh, because uh, I knew he said it was his seventeenth tour. Wow, albums. My gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Well, see, I even shortchanged them. But like I said, that you know, all their own material and just, just keep on going. So, you know, I guess that separates the men from the boys when it comes to, you know, this yes. week. So, uh, so like when you go to a Christian event, because I know, you you know, I've, some things I've read and, and your background, you you know, you're not ashamed of your faith and you're very open about it. Do you bring your secular songs to the Christian shows or do you kind of just pan to that crowd? Probably. Some of them. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, some that we have work on in both in both areas. Because okay. um, I grew up leading worship, you know, and so if it's a case where we're like leading worship at a church, then praise the Lord. Um, if it's not, then we're bringing you know Southern rock to the mix um, yeah. in, in a way that you know people people can enjoy too. And that's why I particularly love that festivals because they, they let us do that. And you know we we stay away from anything that's not gonna uh, that's not gonna land well. You know that's gonna uh, you know offend somebody uh i don't really think any of it would um but there's some stuff that's just more appropriate to play in that in that setting than there is in others yeah um my add just kicked in you were talking about these songwriting rounds have you been invited to play our annual songwriter festival in november here in muscle shoals no but i would love to okay i'll network you uh yeah. we'll powers that be uh lily glanton she did um american idol she runs it yeah. And uh, it, it is a blast. I volunteered last year and like, um, you know, at this table, there'll be Wynn Varble. Then over here will be Tony Arada. You're like, oh, he wrote the dance. And you're just, you know, amongst them. And I think you'd be a good fit, fit for that and get to come out here and do that. So um, after we do this, I'll, I'll send to the powers to be and try to get you guys networked. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'd love that. Because we'd love to have you. Like I said, being from Alabama, could you give us a little bit of that backstory? Like what part you're from and all that? I'm from Clanton. It's got a big peach water tower on the side of the interstate. That's oh, where yeah. I grew up. I graduated high school with the kids I went to preschool with when I was two. Uh, most of my teachers either taught my mama or went to school with my mama. And if they taught mama, then they went to school with my grandparents. Um, so oh. it's a really, really small town. Is it like is that middle Alabama? Yes, sir. Dead in the middle of the state, right between Birmingham and Montgomery. Oh, yeah, right, slap in the middle of it. So, yeah, you're right there in the thick of all of it. Oh, that's cool. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd read that part, and I didn't know exactly what, what area. So, uh, like I said, living in northern Alabama, I go traveling, but I'm still learning, you know, 
various areas and what have you. Yes, um, I want to talk about um, the uh, the stories you put on the website, which is awesome because they were a thrill. And I've got three big ones I wanted to talk about, and 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 they're not, not necessarily in any order, but um, you cited you're a, you're inspired, you're a fan of Morgan Wade. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. let, me, let me tell you, um, and I, why I like that. I had the opportunity to interview her a year or so back, and when I heard her voice. I thought, man, this is like country royalty. Yeah. And then I heard other side of uh, the song she she wrote about, you know, all of her her demons and then like whoever her significant other was uh, going through the motions with her. And I was like, man. And I didn't know anybody else really super appreciated her. And you put the whole uh, picture of her CD or her album on your website. So I was just kind of interested in how you got introduced to her or how, you know, how that connection came to be. I, uh, I want to say uh, I was at the Opry two or three years ago with my mom, we just went, I can't remember who we were going to see. Um, actually, we might've been there with my grandparents. I can't remember. can't remember what it was. We went to the Opry and uh, she was like, her Her face came across the, you know, up and coming whatever. And just this blonde woman covered in tattoos. It's like, that's interesting. Yeah. And I looked for stuff and the first song I heard was Mend, her singing Mend. And, you know, there's, the thing that I really, and I've, I've, I've heard her play a number of times. I've never met her, but the, the thing that I really appreciate, are, I love how she takes, you know, topics and situations that are, could be communicated really harshly and really graphically and probably pretty lazily. Um, but she takes them and sets them out in such a way that's so vulnerable. Um but it's also easy to listen to. Um, and it, and it, and it communicates it in a way that's not somebody just cussing up a storm, even though sometimes there's, there's a place for that. Yeah. Um, I heard mend and it was the first time, you know, I mean, you hear, you hear songs from a guy's perspective all the time of like, you know, one more chance, come on. I'm sorry. I should have said that should have done that, you know, let me back in. And, and there's, there's a, there's plenty of them on the female side too, but, but never have I ever, heard heard a heard a woman saying um come to bed now shut my mouth i don't know what's wrong with me and uh you came along and finally i see that the um the kind of love i'm what what's wrong i have saying it um come to bed now shut my mouth i don't know what's wrong with me you came along and finally i see um whatever how are the rest of it goes uh that just grabbed a hold of me and i was like hold on did, did, did she just say that yeah and then uh you know the reckless album dropped and then the reckless deluxe album dropped and so that's um that was really the soundtrack of this album um for me is gosh run uh i love run can we somewhere for it it's it's yeah. incredible because she because she communicates in a way that's incredibly catchy you know and i i wish i could i wish i could do it if i could write like anybody i'd write like Morgan Wade. yeah well maybe we just get together and write one with her Maybe, maybe we'll see. We'll you see. You, you, you never met her. No, sir. No, no. I've only met her like how I many you are talking via, you know, the the Zoom. Yeah. But, but super nice, super genuine. But same thing with me. You look at it and you're like, man, did she just do a stint in like, uh, you know, San Bernardo Valley Correctional? Because like I said, she's yeah. she's raw, man. She's got them everywhere. But yeah, she uh, she's got a voice like no other. And I was very interested because I've never really had an in depth conversation with anybody about her other than in passing. You know, have you ever heard this song or this song? And you know. But yeah, she's a she's a dandy. That's a good one to uh, to to enjoy and be inspired by. Um, other question about this this album in progress that I read was, um, which is and I didn't know it, and, and, and may God bless his soul. Your, your brother uh, Walker yes, in Talladega Nights, uh, Houston Tumlin. Um, I, I knew he served, and but I didn't know unfortunately he had passed away. Yes, um, like I said, and that's just that was heartbreaking. Like I said, hearing it now because you know. Uh, watching watching the movies and you know young man that he was but um you had a sister i guess she's collaborated with you could you talk about yeah. that story? Which yeah. is amazing. So, i love that yeah so the the i guess the long story of it is when i was uh seven years old i had a band that sang solely bg's music and seven he hit seven yeah we sang <laughs> all my second grade classmates i put them together made them come to the house for rehearsals wow when we started doing talladega nights they got a huge kick out of the fact that like I would sing Bee Gees music all the time. So Will and Adam and all of them would make up these long lost Bee Gees songs and sing them to me, all kinds of craziness. Fast forward 14 years, 
my band's playing a show out at Johnny Cash's house where I met the guy who kind of said, hey, here's this song I did beneath the bow. And the guy comes up out of the audience. It's all the good Lord. And he said, hey, my name's Scott Glazel. I mixed four albums for the Bee Gees. And when you do your album, I want to do it. Golly, man, that's great. Yeah, and I was like, okay, all right. You know, can't say no to that. And I'm sitting at his house, again, 14 years, you know, removed from Todd Nights. So he goes, hey, man, you want to hear some never before heard Bee Gees songs? And he sat and played me an album or two that they had never released. Yeah. Forward, uh, I guess two years from that, I'm getting ready to cut the album. And a month before uh, we went into the studio, uh, Scott had a, a massive heart attack and passed away. Oh, man. So then I'm going, okay, well, I've, I've ran my band for the past seven years. I can run my guys, but I can't do that and press the big red button all at the same time. I want to have somebody back there that I can, you know, trust and respect. And I had forgotten that Hayden Tumlin, Houston's sister, was an audio engineer at East Iris for Universal. And she was like, oh, baby, I got you. And so that was a really, really amazing full circle deal there. Not counting the fact that the first song I ever learned to sing was I Can Only Imagine. The first song I ever recorded was I Can Only Imagine with my dad when I was six. And we cut this record at Mercy Me's studio called The Imagine House that was built on the proceeds of the first song I ever learned how to sing, ever recorded. And then, of course, me and my dad re-recorded it um for the album yeah that was another story i can talk about because that's giving that's giving this fat boy uh goosebumps i, I love every bit of that and, and i think uh you got to be in god's favor man and it's all about timing but you know you can't question just putting you in the right place at the right time with all that stuff just really really amazing and and i love that yeah you know mercy me is uh, you know a staple and a great song and then to get to uh you know go be a part of that studio are, are they located out of nashville or are they somewhere else it's Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, they're uh, they're the studio's in Franklin, um, but they're all kind of scattered around Nashville, Franklin, Columbia yeah. area. Yeah, I lived, I was raised in Franklin when all we had to do was uh, park at the square, and yeah. now they don't let nobody park out there. <laughs> Way too busy. So that's that's really awesome, and um, um, I just really enjoyed uh, you sharing that with me. Um, so what was the next thing I was going to ask you? Just uh this single is going to ride out and you got your TV and then you said in May you're going to tour. And, um, when's the next single? What, what's, what's next? I mean, you're still uh, riding with this one, which is pretty solid, but yeah, the, the next one will probably be next week. If I had to guess, uh, I've got to finalize some stuff with it. Um, but it's a song that's arguably will, will be the most important thing I've ever released, ever touched. Um, it's a song called turned out good. Uh, and the, the basis for it is, um, the only reason I'm able to do what I'm doing is because of the people who've raised me. And the only reason I am the way that I am is because the hell that those individuals left through. Um, my granddad, I'll just give you the whole story. So my granddad um, lost his mom when he was three. She got melanoma picking cotton and died wow. in 1948. Uh, his dad became a belligerent alcoholic after that. And then in 1952, my granddad got strep throat and it ended up turning into rheumatic fever and it paralyzed him. And so he just... They'd leave him sitting in the sand and he'd scoot around on his butt till everybody got off work, come back. And he was about to die because uh, penicillin wasn't really a thing. Yeah. And they said, okay, uh, there's this tent revival we can take you to if you want to go. But that's that's kind of what you got. Yeah. And so the whole family, he, keep in mind he was the youngest of six, the whole family is standing outside this church arguing about who's going to have to take him in there. You know, like. Yeah. You I ain't going in there. You go in. There. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going in. You go. You take it. Yeah. And uh, you know, absolutely plastered. Great granddad holding his seven year old son said, "Well, forget all y'all. I'll do it." Yeah. And he comes stumbling down the aisle with this crippled child, and the evangelist comes up to him and says, "Hey, uh, you know what's wrong with him?" And he said, "He ain't walked in eight months." He said, "Okay." In the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, put him down and let him go. And my granddad took off running. Okay. And rehab, no atrophy, miraculous healing. The whole family converted, built the church I was raised in. Um, that's the first half of Turn Out Good. First half of the song. Um, I, I'd kind of talk about him raising me in the, more or less uh, the pre courses. You know, sometimes I'd look into his eyes and, and they'd seem old. And just by looking, you'd never know that his mama died when he was three, got cancer picking cotton, and fell down in the weeds, and he wasn't tall enough to see what was going on. Yeah. It's when he got paralyzed from the waist down because the fever took his legs. So he'd slide on the ground, but they took him to that tent revival and they all watched him run. So you can't tell me that there ain't a father and there ain't a son because. Oh, amen, hey, brother, preach. 
Yeah. The second half of the song, I did a I did a master's in clinical mental health counseling. And um, because I did so much work with actors and other musicians, I was like, if the good Lord's going to put me there, then I want to know what's going on. And I was sitting out in the, uh, kind of on the patio, more or less, in kind of the garage cooking steaks with dad and said, this was a few years ago. I was like, hey, thanks for, uh, I'm going through that part of my curriculum in the counseling degree where I, I'm learning about how important the first couple gears are of your life as to who you turn out to be without, you know, any relative kinks along yeah. the way. Uh, so thank you for letting me be raised more or less by my grandparents and a bunch of his older sisters and all these old people who had nothing better to do than the worship ground I walked on, you know, while my parents went to work. And I was like, Hey, thanks, you know, for not letting me be just kind of sat with some half-assed half lit sophomore in high school that, you know, didn't care what was going on. And my yeah. dad locked up, started crying and said, the only reason you were raised that way is because I was abused by my babysitter as a child. Nobody knows your mama doesn't know. And I've never told anybody. And I don't really remember my childhood. I want to believe it was good, but I don't know. Cause I don't remember it. Dang. And I want to say he was 52 at the time. So he held on to that for 40 something years. That's, never a told him. That's a lot. And so the second half of the, the, the second verse, or I'm sorry, second course of that song is, you know, sometimes I'd look into his eyes and they'd seem old just by looking. You'd never know that when his mom left, his dad turned on to liquor and the kid got abused by his babysitter. And now he can't remember his childhood, but he grew up and married an Alabama queen. Now his kids in the movies and he's chasing his dreams. And my daddy made a life for all of us the way that he should. So you can't tell me that you've been through too much to be any good because he turned out good. That's awesome. And the moral of the story is whether you lost your mom as a child or you were terminally ill or you were abused by the only person that's ever loved or, you know, the only person that was ever supposed to take care of you or your dad beat you as a child. It can end with you, number one. It doesn't have to just keep on going down the line. But the only common denominator between my granddad being alive and my father not being in prison is Jesus. Jesus Christ, that's it. Yeah. And so regardless of whether we're playing – a stadium or we're playing somewhere on Broadway, I'm able to do that song. And then if my folks happen to be in town, I'm able to say, Hey, not only is this a cool, interesting story, here's your evidence. And I bring my dad up and oh. we'll do, or I can only imagine or we'll do can't even walk and we will have, and then we'll go back to playing free bird or whatever it is we're playing. Cause we're a Southern rock band through and through. Yeah. Um, but the thing that validates this whole experience for me and, you know, confirms it's what I'm supposed to be doing is when I'm sitting at a table or a meet and greet, meeting whoever it is I'm talking to, and there's just as big of a line as burly, hairy guys like you that are lined up bawling their eyes out to meet my dad, asking how in the world you do it. How did your family turn out the way they did after what you've been through? Got any advice? Yeah. And for that, that's the reason why I'm doing all of it. And so that song will come out. Sometime next week. I'm pumped. You got me. You got me pumped for that. Well, let me let me say something else. I'm really impressed with you. Uh, first and foremost, is I wanted to make this mostly about music. You know, I, I know you you hear a lot of the um, TV stuff and movies, which is um, phenomenal. But I, I was more focused on music because that's what I enjoy and that's what I'm a fan of now. But to have to have been a child actor such as yourself, you have won a path that most have. You have a great head on your shoulders. Man, you seem like you, you know, you, you're straight and narrow. And that's a that's a big accomplishment in itself, considering what you went through. Because, you know, when you hear about, uh, you know, people that, that, that were child actors and they're growing up, you know, I, I, I don't know the percentage, but a lot of them, man, they're just destroyed mentally, physically. Like a lot of them, you, you know, you find them like a shell of themselves and you seem like you just took it and run with it. And maybe, you know, another thing, some of these people that have went through that will gravitate towards you, you know, because, you know, you guys are like in a special club that not a lot of people realize, you know, because, I mean, it, it's a lot to be a child and because, you know, you're young and you're focusing on playing or you want to do this and that, but here you are acting. It's like, and seen and you have to do this and do that. I mean, it's just good for you, as I was trying to say. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's all the good Lord. I mean, uh, I've, I've kind of figured out over time, I think the reason why, I made it out alive and, and through it and have continued to do it is because I was able to hit a really high level of success, but it was inconsistent. It was, I do Tyler Ignatz and then we wait two years and I do another film and wait two years and do another film. And, right. and it wasn't that I wanted to wait. It's just that that's how it timed out. Well, I was able to go and do that, but then come back home and nobody at home thought it was cool. You know, nobody really thought it was a big deal. So it was, it was an everyday thing. And so it was common and it wasn't this thing that was just, praised to some crazy amount um 
and so I, I think it 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 rendered a you know a more level of a head than than I think I could have hoped for in that experience. But also, I mean, my mom was with me for every every step of it, you know, and I know she wouldn't let me act like a you know yeah anything sideways either. Well, let me ask you this then. Speaking of that, like um, in those break periods where, like, like you said, you had the great success with Talladega Nights, or you do Diary of a Wimpy Kid. In those between times, like you said, those years or something, did that not crush your soul? Like, did like egotistically? Like, did I mean, you know, being a kid, and then here you are in the limelight, and you're getting all this attention, and then it's just kind of like you said, you kind of pause for a little bit. How did you handle those transitions? Um. Some of it wasn't fun, but also I never really considered it work either. Going and going and doing it, it was just okay. Cool, now I get to go home, and Nathan gets to come over and spend the night. And we get to play, you know, yeah, 007 on the PlayStation Two or Minecraft. You know, it was it was back to it was back to normal. The the life um, that I was in with with film at that age wasn't something I really idolized. I idolized being home, sitting, playing with my buddies more than I did, you know, in a race car with Will Ferrell. So the the priorities were were different and far more wholesome which, which I think really, really helped. Um, it was hard, you know, during, you know, when I would go two or three years without working because I knew that, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I knew that, you know, film is something the good Lord just threw me in the middle of it. So, you know, there'd be two, three years of not doing anything where I was like, man, is this really what I'm supposed to do? And I really questioned, I don't know if I really ever, I did question it a little bit, but, but it was, I was really more disheartened than anything else, you know, because you operate at that level and then nothing. And then, you know, I mean, you might do a little something and then, okay, wimpy kid, boom, 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 four or five films. And then I get to be a freshman in high school and don't work from my freshman year up until my first week in my senior year of high school going, well, what's going on? You know, yeah. like, am I still good at this? Is this what I'm really supposed to be doing? Uh, those times were hard um, because it, it wasn't for lack of trying on my part to, uh, you know, to, to work and, and, and be effective and be good at what I did. Yeah. Um, but also it did allow me to work printing t-shirts with my grandparents at their shop and co-op in high school and have a, a legitimate, um, you know, experience going to the same public school that my mama went to and my grandma graduated from. Yeah. Just to be like a regular person, you know, not necessarily just always celebrate it. Uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. I was I was just kind of curious with the transitions. But one thing that's really, really cool about that, and like I said, then I'll get off the movie topic, is that for generations, like I enjoyed Talladega Nights, and then my kids, who are now in their 20s, enjoyed you and the Wimpy Kids. So it's just like, it's you, you're generational for people, man. That's all. Like, I saw um, you had a billboard going to Comic-Cons. I bet that's crazy. I bet you get all kind of well, it was it was wild that I had that was the only one I've done. I just won. Okay, I did see that I'm in Birmingham, and I did it because uh, I, I had I had offers previously to do them, but the reason why I did that one is because I got to do it with two of the other guys from Wimpy Kid, uh, with Zach and Rob, and that was really that was really precious because we did it in Birmingham, and there were people there that the first person in line to get me to sign something, uh, his older brother was in my kindergarten class. Um, you know, I had people coming up, and my granddad had passed away about the uh, the week before. And I had people come up and being like, hey, man, you don't know me, but uh, we used to get your T-shirts for our, for my daughter's softball team, uh, you know, and your granddad made them. And he was always, you know, so kind and sweet to us. Or yada, yada. So that was a uh, a really special weekend doing that particular Comic-Con. Um, that's cool. Yeah, I didn't know if you did more than that. I just saw it. And I was like, oh, that's awesome, you know, to be in that mix. Because like I said, I've been to a few and, and it's a – it's an eclectic bunch. I mean, we're all no, oh, dude. Dude, I was so because I'd never been to one, and I was sitting there talking to uh, the guy. His name was Alec. Uh, that was with me, and um, it was kind of my hand, uh, handler. And I was like, dude, this is the most American thing I've ever seen. You've got a dude selling Chinese candy on one end. We got another dude selling barbecue on the other end. We got a dude selling samurai swords. We also have some samurai. Yeah. We got yeah. WWE wrestlers, The Walking Dead, Scooby Doo, Wimpy Kid, and a fella selling dinosaur bones and comic books. It's all of that's everything you need to survive. That's a pretty well rounded bunch. You know, I was like, this is the melting pot. This was right. the promise. This is what we were promised. 
in the you know in the constitution who you got comic con yeah it's it's exciting stuff to, to see people like and you're within a few feet of your your heroes and i'll give you a funny comic con story do you know who lou frigno is are you old enough to yeah play? Okay. yeah so check this the out whole- I did, yes. I did some press at a Comic-Con in Nashville some years back, and he was there. And he was set up, like, the calm before the storm. They let the media come in and kind of, you know, diddle around and look at the Batmobile and whatever. And they had him set, and I'm over there talking to him because I remembered him. You know, at 73 or 74, he's built like a tank. Like, I know he just stomped the snide at me if he wanted to. And while I'm talking to him, he's looking at me like this. I'm going to take my glasses off. Like, I felt like he thought I was a moron or something, and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> So later on, I was walking around and one of the uh, media guys, I was like, hey, I think I made Lou Ferrigno mad or something. And he was like, oh, no, he's straining because he's deaf. He couldn't hear me. <laughs> so I thought he was like, who is this loser over here talking to me? But he was trying to lean in to hear what I had to say. I just always love that. <laughs> um, uh-oh, dogs are going off. Well, um, uh, let me get you out of here. I appreciate your time. I know you've had a busy schedule. Uh, two more questions. The first one is, is there anything I should ask you that I didn't? And if you want to give all your social medias and how everybody can get a hold of you and all that. No, no, I, I appreciate the questions that you asked. The easiest way anybody can get a hold of me is Grayson C. Russell. Uh, that's my handle for everything. G-R-A-Y-S-O-N-C, like cat, Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L. And then, you know, of course, stream the music. Uh, keep up what's going on because there will be a, a, a pretty good volume of it by the time, you know, this time next year. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And thank y'all for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. A, a big thing. Like I said, last question. This is going to be a tough one. I had to ask what, what's the capital of North Carolina? Washington, D.C. <laughs> thank you, Washington, sir.